come where we left off last week. I appreciate you all coming to me in the class. Are you able to do that again this week? We're going to pick up in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 13. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, rather serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on fighting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So Paul tells us here, um, at the end of the passage where he's talking about freedom in Christ, he says not to use your liberty, your freedom, as an opportunity for the flesh, um, or in this version it says, to gratify the sinful desires uh, of the sinful nature. What does that mean? What's he talking about there? Using your freedom to, uh, as an opportunity for the flesh. What does that mean when he says not to use it as an opportunity? Are there any other examples we see in Scripture where he talks about that? Christian liberty means 
sharing God's love with others in all that we do. Let's continue now and look at the passage for this week, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with one another, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresy and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing there are things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been, have been crucified, sorry, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So he talks about here the sins of the flesh and points out that the sins of the flesh are obvious. Um, and he contrasts the sins of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. Um, he also contrasts the fact that walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh are against one another. I'm going to go through a few that he talks about. One that I want to point out um, is selfish ambition. I think a lot of the other sins that are listed here um, are probably also a result of selfishness, if you think about it. Sexual immorality, um, jealousy, and the, all of these things are because we want to do something for ourselves to gratify, gratify ourselves. But he calls out specifically selfish ambition. So what does it mean? What does that mean, selfish ambition? Why does he call that one out separately as a different form of selfishness? What does it mean to have selfish ambition? You're focused on yourself instead of Jesus. Oh, sorry. You change to your
Two more things that he calls out is sinful, um, sinful nature. He calls out dissension and heresy. Um, dissension, not just disagreement, but disagreement to the point to where it causes division among the church. And then heresy is not one that really <coughs> talks about. Um, so what is heresy? Something that I really think about more like the 1500s time frame. But what is heresy? What does it mean? Don't talk about it much. Right? Heresy is an opinion that's profoundly at odds with what is generally accepted. It also has a different definition that talks specifically about opinions that go against biblical beliefs. Um, so heresy was a big deal, like I said, probably back in the 1500s. But realistically, heresy has been a big deal in the church since the beginning of the church. Um, if you think about 30, 40 years ago, there are a lot of things that the world kind of disagreed with the, the, what was generally accepted. And now we as a country have different beliefs and the whole and beliefs that line up with the Bible. So I think heresy, even though it comes to mind, you think of it hundreds of years ago, it's really not that long ago and it's still prevalent in the world that we live in today. Paul says that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So remember, the flesh and the spirit are at odds. The world we live in is the world of flesh. And we also, as Christians, were supposed to walk in the spirit. But because we live in this world of flesh, we're going to occasionally let that flesh overcome us from time to time. We're going to fall into sin um, and, and fall victim to it. But that doesn't mean that we accept it. That doesn't mean that we approve of it. And it doesn't mean that we continue to practice it. It's what he's pointing out here. Those who practice these things, Practice these sins and not inherit the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Paul talks about the works or these acts of the flesh. And then he turns around and talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Um, it's really easy for our minds in this passage, or at least for me, um, to think, don't do the acts of the flesh, go do the fruits of the Spirit. Go do these things. But I think the contrast is already made before we get to the fruits of the Spirit. I think the contrast that Paul's talking about is really um, back in verse 14. Back in verse 14, Paul tells us that the law is still fulfilled in one word. What is the law fulfilled in? Love. And love, I believe, is what's contrary to things of the flesh. Paul specifically points out the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Rather than giving in to the sins of the flesh, act in love toward one another. And then we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. So what is the result of acting in love toward one another? These other things. We act in love. These are the things that are the fruits. These are the things that we bear when we love one another, when we love our neighbor as ourselves. Um, the first one, um, love. Love is a fruit of love. When you act in love toward one another, toward your neighbor, it causes your neighbor in turn to act in Christian love toward you and toward others. Um, if you're doing the opposite of that, you're not sharing that love, they're not going to see that love and return it to you, and they're not going to share it with others. When we love your neighbor as yourself, it results in joy. Um, every one of the fruits of the Spirit that we, that we talked about here is all a result of acting in love. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I want to turn over to 1 John chapter 4.
would not live for him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent us his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And love, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he is in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love, the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, and not love God, whom he has not seen. And as he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So we're here today to worship God, not because... He first, not because um, we love him, but because he first loved us. We are here to return that love. We're here to return that worship. Um, we're not here because he loved himself. We're not here because he loved his son. But we're here because he loved us. And he sent Jesus as a sacrifice for us. That's the same kind of love that he wants us to have for one another. That's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. He talks about first, love your neighbor as yourself. Selfless love that they're talking about in John chapter, first John chapter four, that same kind of love that made him send his son to this earth that he didn't have to do, to die on a cross. That's the kind of love that he wants us to have for each other. I think that's what the passage uh, about the fruit of the spirit is centered around in this morning's lesson. That's what I have for the lesson. It's much shorter than I expected. The same length as last week's lesson. Anybody have any thoughts on the lesson? One of the things you're trying to contrast here is life by the Spirit and life by man's selfishness. Or he called it the sinful nature, which is clearly said that is what man's nature is. The acts of the sinful nature, he lists all those. If you live a life that is based on your own uh, thinking, your own logic, your own reasoning, your own desire, whatever, that's the result. Those actions. And this multiple actions and how it's going to end up. The contrast is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit is singular. It's not part there. Those were actions of plural. The fruit is singular. It's a description of what the Spirit does in us if we choose to let the Spirit live. The verses you use in First John says if you've been born of God, uh, then you then you can love. You can't love without being born of God. If you've been born of God, it goes on to say he gave you the Spirit. It's because the Spirit produces this, uh, these, this description here, this fruit. And if you look at it, every time I look at that, every single one of those things is a description of God. And if we're born of God, we're his children, we're supposed to look just like him. So when we're born of him, that fruit is produced by the Spirit in our lives to make us look just like him. So basically, Paul said, you got a choice. you got a choice. You can try to earn your own salvation. You can figure it out on your own. Just ask Eve how well that worked out for her. You know, you can go through history and ask how that's worked out. Here's the end result of your own uh, it's choices because man's basic nature is sinful. Or you can say, I can't do it. I need to be born of God. Let God do it in my life. Allow him, just like you made reference to at the beginning there, by loving your neighbor and all those things. Quit worrying about me. Just step back and say, okay. And those that article you read or the list, every one of those things is talking about just letting God or 
in your life. And when you do that, then God, through His Spirit, produces that in our life. They're not actions that we do. It's a result of, one, of a God working in our life. And then, when you see love, we know what love is. And you'll see the actions that are produced by love in our life. Visiting somebody, or doing this, or saying things. And so, here, he's just contrasting who's in charge. Which goes back to the question that's been there forever. Who you, who's in charge? You? Or are you going to let God do it? And that's where Paul himself always had that big struggle because he was such the, the one that could <coughs> handle it on his own. You know, he was the chief of, you know, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees or whatever. You know, as righteous as you can get, you know, is where he felt he was. Anyway, that's kind of some of the things I see. 